how do we use our own natural resources to get ahead? And I think building this kind of an integrated cropping system that not only provides food for us, provides biofuel, it provides oil for development of cosmetics, pharmaceuticals, biofibers, bioplastics, all those kind of things. All of a sudden, we don't have to import that stuff. All of a sudden, we have our own jobs, our own industries, and all of a sudden, we have a really strong society. Welcome to Richard Haw's YouTube channel, which looks at what we can do today to make Hawaii Island a more sustainable place to live so our children and grandchildren and their grandchildren won't be priced out of here and will be able to stay in Hawaii and live good lives here. Today we're talking with Bill Steiner, formerly Dean of the University of Hawaii at Hilo's College of Agriculture, Forestry, and Natural Resource Management, and we're talking about palm oils. Bill is now the co-founder and general manager of Hawaii Oil Seed Producers, a nonprofit that was started to promote the oil palm industry here in Hawaii and to provide development services specifically to oil seed growers. They have obtained a development grant from the USDA to establish an oil extraction mill and have other grants pending as well. Welcome, Bill. Thank you. My own background actually in, includes a stint with the USDA Ag Research Service as a scientist on the mainland, and I have taught at several other universities besides UH Hilo. All right. And your field specifically is? Genetics, yes. Great. Let's start by asking you to tell us, how did you get interested in oil palms? When I was a dean for the College of Ag, uh, the the challenge was coming along of peak oil, which Richard knows a lot about. And I began to wonder what Hawaii was going to do if all of a sudden we didn't have access to an oil source, especially a vegetable oil source. And so I began researching what could possibly be grown here to offset that. Well, the Midwest has uh, soybeans and corn oil that they use and huge multi-billion dollar operations there. And I thought, well, that corn and soybeans really would not do very well here in terms of production that they produce. And uh, so I kept looking and I came across palm oil, uh, oil palms, and I thought, well, that looks pretty good. And uh, so I began researching that a little bit more, and I, I ended up believing that it would be a very good vegetable oil source for Hawaii could not only provide a biofuel, it could also provide the, the chemicals that would be necessary to develop new industries and new businesses. And recent research in the area has shown that you can grow vegetables and other crops underneath those palms, including cattle. And so I thought, oh, wow, we've got a chance for uh, integrated ag production systems here. And given a limited amount of space in Hawaii, I thought that would be a very good approach to trying to put a vegetable oil source in place. We found out that oil here will produce about 600 110 gallons per acre. That compares to 50 to 60 gallons per acre for soybeans on the mainland. So you can see the big difference there. It is the highest producing oil system in the world. It has been around for 5,000 years. It was used originally as an edible oil uh, for many, many countries and many, many different peoples. And uh, the only thing was to try and find out if it would grow in Hawaii. Wow, that is an impressive amount of um, possibility there. Bill, you know, uh, you were talking about the various different palm oil plants mm -hmm. and the specific characteristic that you were talking about was something that didn't grow quite as tall. Can, mm -hmm. can you explain that? In the process of looking for palm oil tree sources that I could bring to Hawaii, I went down to Costa Rica and visited a group of people there who had bought the spinoff from Dole Pineapple of their uh, oil palm operations. Not many people know that Dole was doing that, but they had them, and they had a big nursery down there. And so I found out they had a hybrid tree between the American palm species, which is now extinct in North America, and the African oil palm. Well, the African oil palm grows 80 to 100 feet tall, and you can imagine the problem with trying to harvest those nuts all the time. The new hybrid had a gene for dwarfism, so it's a very short-growing tree. It had a gene for increased fecundity, which means it had produced more fruit, and it had a gene for uh, temperature tolerance. So they suggested to me to use that tree because they thought that it would grow well in Hawaii. And I thought, well, okay, we'll try it. Normally, African palms and oil palms in general grow between 11 degrees north and 11 degrees south latitude. And so we're at 16 to 28 degrees. So there was a question of whether it would grow here. And so I said, okay, we'll try it. And I ordered some seeds and we ended up trying them and it was robustly, profoundly successful. Now these crops would be growing on a lot of what's former sugarcane land? Oil palm has gotten a bad reputation because of what's happened in Indonesia and Malaysia and 
uh, even in some places in the Amazon basin in Brazil, where they're destroying natural forests to put these plantations in. Uh, and so I realized that, and I thought, well, the way to do that would be to grow it on sugarcane land, which we lost our forests on that 150 years ago. So it's growing weeds, it's growing basically uh, weedy trees, and it's being used for grazing. So maybe we could increase that to do better than what it was doing. So Bill, how does a farmer harvest this and get it to the processing? And what is involved in the processing to, to make a transportation fuel? We have a, a small mill set up and, and it's producing oil on one of the farmers uh, that has about 25 acres of palms. He produces the raw oil, but he also has to run it through a filtration system to get impurities out of it. Then you can actually burn it directly in a diesel engine, or you can refine it even more into other kinds of fuels, uh, or you can refine it into edible oil, which takes some of the fatty acids out of it. So there's different ways you can go with the oil once you've got it. Now, I know that Pacific Biodiesel is marketing their biodiesel, and they're making it from used cooking oil, and also now from sunflowers, which they're growing on Maui and Kauai. But this oil produces six times more than sunflowers do. And so I think that they're kind of going at it about the wrong way. We had discussions with them, and they were very excited about it. They said they would buy all the oil we could produce. Uh, and so we have a ready market, and all we've got to do is just start producing the, the oil and grow, planting the trees and growing them. The mill itself is pretty small. It could probably fit in a 1,200-square-foot house. That really beats a sugar mill, as you know, and it beats a lot of the big process mills that they're developing for getting oil out of grass and things like that on the mainland. We're looking at systems that are not only small, but can be spread around the island in different villages, kind of like some of the sugarcane mills used to be, and used locally so that once you process the oil, you could directly refine it in such a way that you could market directly to the people in the villages, uh, or you could sell it on a larger market to the rest of the island if you wanted to. So Bill, how long were you working on this? Oh, I started when I was dean of the College of Ag, about 2000. 2007 or 8. And uh, I got the seeds around 2010. We grew them out in a, a leased nursery that we had to lease. We grew the trees out then. I think about 2012 to 2013, we knew we were going to be successful at growing the palms. Then we just had to wait and see what the production was going to be. And it turned out that the production was uh, much more robust than we thought it would be. It turned out to be uh, about the same as Costa Rica, which was what surprised me. So currently, what's the situation? 40 acres of Test plots. That was one of the problems I had was how to do the testing. I wanted it to grow in different altitudes, different soil types, different climates, so we could really see how robust this thing was. So I spread the word among small farmers, and I had uh, about eight or ten small farmers come forward and say, we'll take some. And uh, they planted them out. And so I did indeed have some at clear up to about 3,000 feet elevation and uh, some at sea level on the Hamakua coast and some others at, at other places and different soils different rain climates. We also wanted to see what insects would attack them, what funguses would attack them. We found out that after they got past the seedling stage, nothing bothered them. They were very robust. One of the things we also did was not encourage fertilization because we wanted to see how they do without fertilizers. We wanted to see how they do without pesticide applications, uh, and they did fine. They did great. And that means we could limit the amount of fertilizers and, and pesticides we could import to, to take care of these trees. So about 2014, we formed the, the Hawaii oil seed producers so we could go forward as an organized group. And in 2015, I had a bill put into the state legislature to try and get funding in place. Uh, that bill passed the first reading and then it died in committee never got out of committee. I tried a couple of years more after that and never went anywhere. And so I began then around 2018, 2019, going after funding, outside funding. Uh, but now there's been a lot more funding put into the federal area for biofuel development and for innovation in agriculture. So we're going to try again to see if we can get federal funding. But beyond that, I'm also trying to get funding now, beginning this year, through um, private investors. We're looking for a long-term investor who's not looking to make money as much as he is to make a contribution to the society. I'm told that those kind of investors are out there, so we'll try and find them. Why would someone want to invest in this? What are all the benefits of it? First of all, you've got to have the farmers involved. I've managed to get about 45 farmers now lined up to grow these things. Once you've got those farmers lined up, you've got a place to put the trees. So what Hospital wants to do is be the nursery. 
We want to develop the trees, sell the seedlings to the farmers, and then help the farmers raise those trees and get them to production stage, and then act as a uh, middleman in between marketing the oil and marketing carbon credits, which these trees also store carbon. And so all of a sudden, you've got an additional market for the tree itself. Uh, the trees actually store about three times more carbon than any other tree does. Grass stores about seven tons of carbon per year, an acre of grass. These trees store up to 48 to 64 tons. So you can see the difference. Beyond that, we would want to be uh, in a place where we can help farmers get established in terms of making those trees grow and in terms of helping them utilize the space under those trees. Because as an island, you well know that we're short of food all the time. 95% uh, of our imports are food. And so if we can grow our own food, we're much more secure, much more uh, resistant. I think we need to have in place people who can help farmers either lease their land under those trees or share crop the land under those trees or develop in such a way that young farmers can have access to land, which they can't very well get access to now without having some big funders behind them. Land is just too expensive. So by doing it this way, we think we can help the farmers with the trees and we can help the ag young ag producers with their agricultural wishes. You know, we just had a um, meeting. Was it just last week? Yes. Yeah. Everything was new. And you know, I'd, I'd like for you to explain what took place at that meeting and why it was significant. Because from where I stood, it was like, wow, look at this. It's a brand new start. Even if we've been talking about it for 10 years now. That meeting kind of grew out of discussions with you uh, and with Gary uh, Rosenberg, because the two of you ha have recognized for some time now that we need to do something different. And so I got to thinking about that and I thought, well, what we need is a new Ahapua approach, but maybe in, include not just the old Ahapua sections that were divided up by streams and ridges and so forth, but maybe include the whole Hamakua coast area and, and along the Puna coast. So, yeah, I decided I would contact this new Office of Sustainability, Climate, Equity, and Resilience, OSER. I call it O-S-C-E-R. It's a new county office. It's in the uh, Department of Development at the county level, and I thought, these guys are new. They may be tossing around for how to approach this whole problem that comes with sustainability. And I thought, let's give them, let's give them a show. Let's tell them what we're what we're at. So I invited some farmers. I invited some university folks. I invited the Osser people, and we all sat down. And I gave a little presentation where we were going, and everybody seemed. I thought quite excited about it, and they seem to be accepting of the idea. In fact, a couple of them now are saying, let's get together again, let's, let's keep this going. I haven't heard much back from Osser, unfortunately, because they're really the people we need to try, try and get on board, because if the county is on board, then everybody's going to be coming on board. And some of the grants we're going after may require a county being on board, so we want to have that happen if, if possible. It seemed to me so logical, and I'm really excited about the possibility. There's a possibility... Uh, for what's called food hubs that one of the Pune area residents has been working on. His idea is to have a food hubs with different five or six different farmers involved that come together and they grow their food and they trade the food at the at, when they get together, barter it back and forth. And then you extend that into bigger interconnected exchanges. And that fits right into the idea of the oil palm because you could have the food hubs kind of an overarching system over all of this. So the farmers are making money not just from food hubs, but from the palm trees, from the carbon credits, and from other ways that they can imagine. Frankly, the, the collapse that followed tourism uh, in the pandemic really kind of got to me. That should have been frightening to everybody. But what's happening? Tourism, again, is coming back. In the long run, it can't be sustainable. Now, there's been a recent study that's been finished. It's a study on climate change and the impact of oceans on our climate, on our ports and everything. What it shows is a possible 6 to 12 foot rise in ocean by 2100. That's 75 years away. We're not going to get tourists if that happens. Beaches are going to be gone. To me, it makes sense that we need to be thinking that far ahead right now. Yeah, you know, I, I'm with you because instead of depending on stuff being imported and paying for it with uh, fossil fuel, whatever we can produce here to support ourselves would prevent 
our kids from leaving because right now there's so many of our people are leaving to to find uh, jobs at someplace else whereas yeah. if we would do what you're looking into what we're supporting we could maintain the population over here that's right you know we've got to do something and what you've been talking about and, uh, and a bunch of us have been talking about is a way for us to be self-sufficient our plant cost about sixty-five thousand. that's for a small plant that would fit into a village if you wanted a bigger plant you can go up to several hundred thousand if you look at an investment of say a hundred to fifty thousand for each village around the island and say here's how you set up to be independent and to be resilient and to be sustainable and produce your own oil and here's how you go about producing it i think that would work maybe a, a couple of million to really get the big island going strong you know i think it would really help you know I, what i keep on wondering is if we can have some way of retaining the value within the island and the state some uh, ways you can do that is with a core or a employee stock option kind of a plan so when you do something like that the value stays within the island instead of somebody coming in with plenty of money and extract yeah, the value yeah. out of here yeah i calculated kind of off the cuff calculation of how much money could be kept in the islands if we weren't buying uh, offshore fuel if we weren't buying off offshore animal feed if we weren't buying uh, offshore clothing and material for clothing it came out to about five billion dollars yeah. uh, we keep that much money in the islands think of what we can do with that money it's just amazing and can we get our legislature to look at that we haven't yet I haven't been able to. I did want to say that in terms of making money for the farmer and having multiple income streams, he can have a stream coming off of leasing some of the land under the palms. He can have a stream coming in from the carbon credits. He can have a stream coming in from the vegetable oil. But there's another overlooked stream, and that is the state sometime in the past began funding conservation restoration programs. Now, we have 350 endangered species of plants. They were all taken out. A lot of them were taken out when we put the sugarcane in place. So now we can use the palms as a fake forest and grow these plants under the palms. And then we can get money from the state for restoration of those plants back into the wild again. So now all of a sudden we're, we're not only being an oil producing system, but we're also being a restoration system, restoring the islands. And I think that's a big, big plus here. Why do you think the legislature here is not interested in this? I think originally when I went to them with the idea, they didn't have a uh, the vision that was needed to see what was coming down the pike, right? Pandemic changed all that. All of a sudden, they realized they were behind the eight ball. I think that kind of scared everybody. So in 2015, it just wasn't there yet for them. I mean, thinking about it, it should have been, because they should have been looking 15, 20 years down the road instead of looking at tomorrow. You know, we had Paul Brubaker and uh, Pat Sullivan, and they were warning us that we yes. got to change. And what they were saying was during the pandemic, we were going pretty well. You know, we were above the rest of the United States for the most part. And then when the pandemic happened, we dropped down. And now we're at a point where we're on the bottom and the rest of the states are above us. And it appears that most people don't understand that this is the case that we got to do something because we're on the bottom. And they also think tourism is going to pull them back out of it. Right? Yes. And that's not the case so far. We're still behind where we were five years ago on tourism. But I, I think we're on the right track. So it's a matter of pulling all our allies together, you know, all, all the folks that are talking the same language and organizing ourselves and making sure that we all are working together for a purpose. And the purpose is to take care of the coming generation. We need to come up with a, a very defined plan, step by step. And then we need to take that to the state ledge again and say, here's where we want to go. And you've only got 25, 30 years to come up with an answer. It may take five to 10 years to get all this in place. And so we need to have you working on this now. And we need to be emphatic about it. We need it now, yes. not tomorrow, not next year, not 10 years from now, too late then. I agree 100%. Thank you very much, Bill. This was very interesting to learn about. And thanks, everyone, for watching. We will be back in two weeks with another episode of Richard Haw's vlog. Mahalo for watching and ahui ho. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Leslie. <laughs> Bye.